Welcome to Renegading. What if the racism and inequality that America faces today are not accidental, but actually happened by design? Many people assume that the residential racial segregation in the US happened organically, but it simply didn't. What if there were unconstitutional plans to segregate black and white families by using planning laws and the housing market? Richard Rothstein, welcome to Renegade Inc. Thank you very much. Um, your book, uh, The Colour of Law, uh, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. The really interesting word in there is the word forgotten. Uh, why, why do you use that word? Uh, and if it is forgotten, how was it airbrushed? Well, the, it's forgotten because it was well known when these policies were being implemented when the federal government was creating separate public housing projects, for example, for African-Americans and whites, frequently using those projects to segregate neighborhoods that had previously not been segregated. Families who were directed to a project designated by their race certainly knew what was happening. It was no mystery. When the federal government uh, imposed a, a policy on an explicitly racial basis to move the white working class population out of urban areas into single family homes in all white suburbs, frequently with uh, deeds that uh, had a provision that prohibited resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans, families that had FHA mortgages and living in developments that were financed by the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, certainly knew that they were living in a segregated community. So it was no mystery in, in those days what was going on. Today, however, we've adopted a, a myth. Uh, we call it de facto segregation. We assume that the reason that this country is so segregated is because of individual choices and private bigotry. So this history has been forgotten. We've really whitewashed the history, to use a term, uh, as a rationalization not to confront the fact that the residential segregation in this country is a civil rights violation. It's unconstitutional. It was government created and requires a remedy. And um, when you say it was government created, is this a, a structural occurrence? Uh, is it somebody sitting behind the scenes and saying, no, actually, we're going to do this. We're going to overlap these policies to ensure it delivers this economic and social result. And if so, who's the brainchild behind it all? No, it was not a, um, a coordinated conspiracy but it was a system of uh, separate racially explicit policies implemented by many government agencies at the federal, state, and local level right. that created the pattern of segregation that we have uh, today. It wasn't the action, let me say, of rogue bureaucrats. It's not that they were people just in individually taking initiatives. This was explicit racial policy. Uh, the Federal Housing Administration had a manual it was called the underwriting manual. It was distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to recommend proposals of developers for bank, federal bank guarantees for creating subdivisions in the mid 20th century. The manual said explicitly that uh, you could not recommend for a federal bank guarantee a development that was going to be racially integrated. Uh, the manual went so far as to say, and I'm quoting, that you couldn't recommend for a federal bank guarantee a subdivision or project that was going to be all white if it was going to be located near where African Americans were living because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. So this notion of de facto segregation is just other nonsense. This was an explicit policy. Now, other agencies of government had similar policies. I don't uh, think there was anybody uh, sitting behind a curtain coordinating them. They didn't have to. All government agencies at the time were implementing similar policies. When we then look across America today, uh, um, we see police brutality. We see uh, economic uh, disadvantage. Uh, we see... Uh, inequality that's off the charts. What you're pointing to is the root cause, uh, which are many, many years of structured policy decisions which have delivered this. And today, uh, we are looking at the banquet of consequences. Yes, uh, perhaps the biggest consequence is what we refer to as the wealth gap between African Americans and whites. On average, African Americans are lower income uh, on average, uh, 
African-American families have 60% of the income on average of white families. But you'd expect if there was a 60% income ratio, there'd be a 60% wealth ratio as well. But in reality, African-American household wealth is only about 5% of white household wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid-20th century, when the federal government moved the white working class on a racially explicit basis out of urban areas into these single-family homes in all-white suburbs. Those homes appreciated in value over the next couple of generations. They sold in the mid-20th century for about, in today's dollars, about $100,000 affordable to any working class family, black or white, who had a job in the post-war economy. Those homes now sell for $300,000, dollars $500,000, maybe a million dollars in some places. Uh, the families who own those homes, subsidized by the federal government on a racial basis, gained wealth from the appreciation and equity. Uh, in the value of their homes. And they use that wealth to send their children to college. They use that wealth to perhaps take care of temporary emergencies like uh, unemployment or, or medical emergencies. They use it to, to subsidize their own retirements and they use it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. That is probably the single most important, although there are others, but the single most important factor that creates the racial inequality that we have today in this country. It's a legacy of these unconstitutional policies that the federal government followed. And the reason I emphasize so often that these policies were unconstitutional is because they're civil rights violations. They require us to remedy them. We can't simply say, let bygones be bygones. These were done in violation of the constitutional rights of African Americans, and we have an obligation to redress it. Speaking of civil rights, America produced an economist called Henry George, uh, he wrote a book called Progress and Poverty, uh, inspired many, many people from Churchill through Tolstoy, Bertrand Russell, Hayek, uh, Bernard Shaw, people from many, many different uh, economic schools of thought, but they could unify on one issue, which is the land issue, uh, and land being uh, the mother of all monopolies, I think, as Churchill put it. He also inspired Mr. George a man called Martin Luther King. So when we start to talk about civil rights uh, and unearned increment, unearned wealth through accumulation uh, of, of wealth through land, divided into two uh, ethnic groups, uh, we really come to the nub of it, don't we? Is Henry George uh, as relevant today as he always was? And can he be used for the redistribution of, of this kind of uh, economic disparity? Well, he was a man of his time. Uh, he's certainly relevant, but I think you just summarized the relevance of it. The enormous wealth gap that we have is largely attributable to uh, the fact that whites were assigned residences in communities that appreciated the value and African-Americans were denied those opportunities. But it's a very, it's a bit more complex than that. African-Americans also own homes in many places, but their neighborhoods haven't appreciated the value to the same extent that white neighborhoods have. So home ownership itself, land ownership itself, is not necessarily uh, the uh, key to, to wealth in this country. It, it depends largely on the racial inheritance we have from our failure to deal with the legacies of slavery, a combination of these housing policies as well as income policies uh, that I described before. The, um, I said that the African-American incomes are 60% of white incomes. On average, there's a whole story behind that too. Federal policy in the New Deal during the Depression, the Roosevelt administration, excluded African-Americans not only from equal housing opportunities, but for equal employment opportunities. And uh, the legacy of that continues as well. So it's not only wealth, but wealth is a good part of it. Building communities, building solid communities, uh, ultimately increases the value of land, which gives a certain economic freedom. You, I'm sure, would agree with that, would you? Well, but what I'm, I, I, I'm saying to you is that African-American neighborhoods have not seen the value of land increase despite the building of communities there. And that's because the demand for, for housing in those communities, the ability of people to bid for housing in those communities isn't as great as it is in white communities. So it's a combination of a discriminatory land policy or housing policy and discriminatory income policies as well. Just tell us what the societal fallout is when you segregate in this way. And I hope that isn't a trite question. 
No, it's not a trite question at all. It's a very important question, and it's one that uh, very few Americans understand. The segregation that we have imposed on this country, and by we, I mean our government, is responsible for much of the social inequality that we know in this country today. In one area, in education, for example, we have an enormous achievement gap between black and white children, African-American children uh, achieve in school at lower levels than white children on average. That's almost entirely because we have concentrated lower income children, the most disadvantaged children in this country in single neighborhoods where uh, they have less access to healthy food, uh, less access to healthy air, all uh, things that contribute to low achievement. For example, I remember I wrote a column once about the fact that uh, African-American children in urban areas have asthma at four times the rate of middle-class children because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more diesel trucks driving through their neighborhoods, more deteriorated buildings. And if a child have, has asthma, that child is more likely to be up at night wheezing and coming to school drowsy the next day. And if you have two groups of children who are identical in every respect, except one has a higher rate of asthma, that group's gonna have lower average achievement. And so you start adding up all the consequences of segregated neighborhoods, asthma, lead poisoning, which is much more predominant in black neighborhoods than in white ones, mass incarceration and, and police abuse that we've spent so much time paying attention to, which could not exist if, to the extent it does if we weren't concentrating the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods uh, where they have no access to good jobs or transportation to those jobs or schools with high achievement. So the achievement gap is one consequence of this segregation. Health disparities between African Americans and whites. African Americans in this country have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease than whites on average, in large part because African Americans live again in more polluted neighborhoods, uh, less access to healthy food, to medical care. That, and, uh, and I say mass incarceration and police abuse, I think that the segregation that we've created also uh, predicts to a large extent the very, very dangerous and frightening political polarization that we have in this country today. It largely tracks racial lines. It's not entirely racial. But how can we ever expect in this country to develop the common national identity that's necessary to preserve this democracy if so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other? that they have no ability to empathize with each other, no ability to understand each other's life experiences. So the consequences of the segregation that we've created, in addition to the, the wealth and the income gaps themselves, are enormous. The Lyndon and Banking Institutions uh, when they drew up contracts with interest rates, with flexible interest rates, I think they knew in the beginning that these problems were going to come back later on where folks weren't going to be able to afford the mortgages as the interest rates increased. It put a lot of people in situations where they were taking food out of refrigerators, taking kids out of higher education. They're not able to afford college anymore. And it is making a really, really bad situation worse. These are loans which were made by one of the major lenders in the city and in this country, Wells Fargo, in which Wells Fargo targeted minority communities in the city, uh, put borrowers into loans that they could not afford, put borrowers into loans um, that, that were of the subprime variety, therefore more expensive and less advantageous to the borrowers. Many of the communities in which African Americans live in the city were establishing momentum. There was development activity that was occurring. We were seeing signs of vitality in many of these communities and the results of the Wells Fargo foreclosures and the subprime lending practices of that lender and others um, has significantly impaired that progress and, and brought it to a halt. They're not worrying about, they don't, they don't come in the heart of it. Like you in the heart of it, so you see, they don't really see the struggle if they don't come in the heart of it, they see the outside of it. That's like looking at the cover of a book and seeing the, outside of the, seeing the outside of a book, but if you don't go inside the book, then you'll never know what the book about. So they're not worrying about nobody else but themselves. And I think it's wrong, because if they come in the heart of it and they see it, they'll be willing to help. Richard, we mentioned uh, in the first half the very obvious uh, consequences now that uh, America, Americans are harvesting after such a pernicious, uh, uh, unequal uh, policy. Um, when you uh, look at places like Baltimore, 
uh, areas where uh, black families were offered ninja loans, uh, where they didn't have a job, didn't have the wages to pay for it. But you can't really uh, blame people. If you get offered a huge amount of credit and you are in poverty, and your life chances are low, you're going to take that anyway, aren't you? You're going to take that, you're going to take that, those mortgage offers and try and make something of, uh, of the situation that you're in. Well, partly, but this wasn't just an offer of a lot of credit. This was deceptive marketing of exploitative loans where, whose terms were hidden. They frequently had ex, uh, exploding interest rates so that the families who took out these loans, these were typically re refinancing loans, not initial mortgage loans. This was refinancing homes at very low interest rates that would then explode a couple of years later into very high rates without the ex later explosion being advertised when the markets were, when, when the uh, loans were initially being marketed. They had very, very high prepayment penalties so that if a family wanted to prepay their loan before the, the interest rates exploded, they couldn't do it. So this wasn't simply a question of offering people something that uh, was attractive. It was uh, deceptive practices. Uh, uh, mortgage uh, brokers were given bonuses for selling loans of this kind, even if families were fully qualified for the traditional loans that were being offered in white neighborhoods. So this was a violation of the Fair Housing Act, which prohibited ongoing discrimination in the sale and, and of housing and rental of housing, as as you know from the Baltimore suits, uh, to some of the banks, and it wasn't just Wells Fargo, but there was others as well, uh, sent uh, mortgage sales salespeople to black churches on Sundays, not to white churches. Uh, they preyed on African Americans in particular uh, in order to to market these loans. So this was a, a blatant violation of the Fair Housing Act. It compounded the already existing segregation of these neighborhoods. It didn't create it, but it compounded it. You've done uh, amazing work to chart this sort of forgotten history. Uh, those people trying to airbrush it, uh, you're uh, a real pain to them, uh, and, and brilliantly so. Uh, when we come to solutions, um, how do we begin to think about how to unify neighborhoods, how you can come to a different social contract, a different social deal, uh, which truly does make America uh, a unified, uh, united state? Well, you know, the solutions to this are well known. There, there's nothing mysterious about the solutions. Policy experts know them, housing experts know them, think tanks generate papers explaining them. What's missing is not solutions, ideas. What's missing is a new civil rights movement like we had in the 20th century that's going to, in the words of our um, late civil rights leader and congressman, uh, John Lewis, make good trouble to make it untenable to maintain these segregated patterns. Right now, for example, we should have constitutionally required an affirmative action program in housing. The federal government should be subsidizing the purchase of, of housing by middle-class, working-class African-American families in suburbs that are now unaffordable to them, but that would have been affordable to them when they were created. That's a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. There's nothing mysterious about it. There's no political support for it. So the problem is not coming up with the, the program. The problem is developing that political support. And that's true no matter which party is in power. Uh, a curious thing about the politics of this country is the Democratic Party, which is more liberal on racial issues, is a, it's a combination of low-income minority voters and suburban voters in, in exclusive white communities who are socially liberal, economically moderate to conservative, and who are all in favor of racial progress so long as, and the term we use here is not in my backyard. So you have to overcome that political resistance. We need a new civil rights movement, much like we had in the 20th century, that's going to change the way in which we think about these problems in order to implement the very obvious solutions that are sitting there waiting to be implemented. When uh, Martin Luther King, influenced by Henry George, wrote uh, Chaos or, or Community, uh, do you think it's the case that when he uh, turned his attention to the uh, economy, that is when uh, people decided actually this guy 
is way too dangerous and we can't put up with this anymore. Well, I don't think really that's what happened. I think that the point at which he lost universal support was when he came out against the Vietnam War and uh, people began to think of him no longer as a pure civil rights leader, but as somebody who, um, as I say, against the Vietnam War as well. The Vietnam War terribly divided this country in the 1960s. Uh, he took a long time to come out against it to align himself with uh, anti-war activists as the anti-war movement uh, proceeded. And I think that's what uh, undermined the universal support for him, at least in, in theory, if not in practice. He barely had begun his program to desegregate neighborhoods when he was assassinated. He had moved to Chicago. He was uh, planning open housing marches which were not very moderate, very moderate. They were not uh, aimed at trying to implement the kind of program I was talking about, of subsidizing African-Americans to move to communities from which they'd been excluded. His sole purpose was what we called at the time open housing, which was to uh, prohibit discrimination on a racial basis against home buyers or renters uh, who couldn't um, were prohibited from buying or renting homes, even if they had the money to do so without federal subsidy. So it was a very moderate program that he was uh, proposing to, to uh, implement. He planned marches through white neighborhoods in the western suburbs of Chicago. Uh, he met with violence uh, when he did that, and we never made much progress after that. The NIMBY, uh, as we call it, the knelt in my backyard lot, um, that, they really are a massive barrier to progress, aren't they? What would be a, a way to go and get the sort of oxygen needed around this issue so people can begin to uh, A, understand it and B, put an economic solution to it? And I'll just say this, because as soon as you begin to explain this type of issue, and again, it comes back to progress on the one hand and poverty on the other, at a dinner table in the UK here or in the US, people find it almost impossible to accept uh, that dichotomy? Well, you know, I'm old enough to remember the 1960s when the desegregation of restaurants and buses, swimming pools and water fountains was considered unacceptable, didn't have majority support, uh, and a civil rights movement called attention to it, caused trouble, uh, forced the government to be constantly dealing with disruptions around uh, enforced segregation. And eventually, I wouldn't say a majority of the country, but a, a sufficiently effective plurality of the country came around to understand that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful actually to both blacks and to whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy, and we began to implement changes. I don't know what the tactics of a new civil rights movement will be. You know, the, these kids these days, they use these phones with their thumbs. I don't know how to do that. Uh, that's not the way we did it in the 1960s, but they'll come up with ways. Uh, we are now having in this country, as you may know, a more accurate and passionate discussion about the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow than we ever have had before in American history. We have white elected Southern politicians running around the South removing statues to commemorate uh, the defenders of slavery. That was unheard of just five, 10 years ago. Uh, we had uh, 25 million people in this country uh, participating in Black Lives Matter demonstrations in the last few months, uh, most of whom were white participating in these demonstrations, also inconceivable just a few years ago. Now, that movement, that Black Lives Matter movement was focused uh, almost entirely on police abuse. It hasn't moved beyond that into organizing uh, local civil rights groups that will take action on issues of residential segregation, uh, but it can. It certainly provides the basis for it. And although I'm not confident that we'll have that kind of movement that will achieve uh, desegregation, um, I'm hopeful that it may. You know, one of the things in, in my book, The Color of Law, that I do is I describe how all the textbooks used in history classes in high schools all over the country lie about this history. And one of the things that local civil rights groups can begin to do and are beginning to do in some places is challenging their local school districts about the misleading education they're giving children about the history of racial segregation and how it happened in this country. If the next generation doesn't learn this history any better than present generations have, they're going to be in this poorer position to remedy it.
as we've been. But I think there's an opportunity to move forward in that regard. So I think that there are many, many opportunities for uh, direct action in local communities to begin the conversation beyond police abuse, which is an important thing to focus on, but to move beyond that to the underlying segregation, which creates the environment in which that kind of police abuse nurtures itself. Richard Rothstein, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That's it from Renegade Inc. this week. We'd love to hear from you, studio at renegadeinc.com. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently, but until then, stay curious. <laughs>